So welcome everybody. Thanks a lot for being here in Quebec. So it's good for me to be not too far from home, to have such great attendance of different people all around the world. Uh, so today I've been asked to talk about practical application of precision feeding. So my talk will outline what I think should be feasible with precision feeding in different areas of production. Uh, it's now a presentation about in-depth requirement and modeling. There's people in the room like Jean-Yves Dormat, Candido Pomar, that much smarter than me that have done a lot of work on that. I'll talk a bit about it, but it's not going to be about how much you need to feed those pigs with. Uh, when you talk about precision feeding, you can talk about smart feeding, blend feeding. Okay, those things for me mean the same things, although they can be applied in different way. And like I said, I'm going to focus on lactation, gestation, pre a bit, nursery, finisher, and gill development. So why are we thinking about precision feeding or blend feeding? Uh, a couple of things that are important. I brought that slide from a presentation from Jean-Yves Dormad. Uh, the social environmental aspect is really important. We talk about reduction of nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, greenhouse gas. Uh, that aspect is really important. And the first presenter this morning talked about that in his presentation. The economics is also important. When you invest in trust feeding system, you need to make sure that you develop some return on investment, if, if it's possible. So the economic is really important as well. How we do it? I don't think today we can do it like that. You know, it's the old days of feeding sow. Still, some people are feeding by hand their sow and some of their pigs, but there's no way you can do precision feeding or blend feeding or whatever type of feeding to meet the requirement of the sow on angel basis or growing finishing pigs by feeding by hand. You need equipment. So Gestal, Giga is one of the company. There's many companies in the world that develop those automated feed system. So this is what we have today that we didn't have 15, 20 years ago. So we can go down that path. So let's start with lactation. So just some basic people in the room, nutritionists, you all know about that. In lactation, most of the farm will feed one single diet, okay, all the way through. Although there are some people that feed more than one diet, but the general practice those days is to still use one lactation diet throughout the whole lactation. We formulate based on amino acid and energy, okay. Amino acid is the most single important nutrient that we look at when we formulate our lactation diet, and we also look at energy for sure. Our amino acids are based on SID lysine requirement, okay, on a gram of lysine intake per day. So we determine how much gram of lysine intake per day we need to feed that sow, and then we balance the diet accordingly. And we look at energy to try to meet energy requirement, okay. In lactation, it's a challenge, okay. We can meet the lysine requirement, but in order to meet energy requirement, it's almost impossible, and I'll show you some data on that as well. So what is the first challenge? But we need to know how much we need to feed the sow in terms of amino acid, okay? It's based on the weight of the sow, which has minimal impact on the requirement, but mostly on litter weight gain. So how much those pigs grow in during lactation will drive how much lysine the sow will need to maintain the growth of those pigs and also maintain the best she can or body condition throughout lactation. Then, based on intake, we set the percentage of lysine within our diet. So intake is a big part of the equation when we want to look at feeding lactating sow. For example, if you have a sow that needs 56, of gram, 56 gram per day of lysine with an intake of 6 kg per day, you need to formulate a diet at 0.93 digestible lysine. Okay, pretty simple math based on requirement, intake, but the requirement and intake vary a lot. That's where the challenge comes after. For net energy or energy, it's really hard to meet 100% requirement. That's why sow are losing body condition in lactation. To meet 100% of the requirement of a sow in lactation, it's almost impossible on an average basis of the herd. So we try to do our best, but there's a limit that we cannot meet on that end. We need model. Okay, there's model that we use to determine the amount of lysine energy that a sow needs during lactation. So I'm just using Haheron model, which is a whole model. Frank Haheron was a great researcher in the late 80s, 90s, early 2000s. I don't know when he passed away, but it was a reference uh, in Canada for us. And we have the Enra model. Jean-Yves Dormat is here. Jean-Yves knows that model much better than anybody else in the room here. So two different models that will assess the cell requirement. In terms of maintenance, oops, I went two clicker at the same time. It's a bit confusing. So in terms of maintenance requirement, if you look at Hiron and Rinra, 1.8, 1.6 gram per day of lysine, pretty much the same. Where the difference come versus Ahern and Enro is that you have about a difference of about 28% in lysine requirement based on later growth, okay? And I'm gonna come back on that with second example, but that's a big difference. 23 gram of lysine per kg of later weight gain 
and 16 to 17 with the NRA model. So if I do an example with the two model, with the SAW at 275 kg, 2.75 kg per day of letter growth, the energy requirements are about the same, 18,000, 18,500 kilocal of net energy. But if you look at the lysine gram per day requirement, 65 versus 47. If you took a feed intake of 6 kg on both, both systems, the energy level that you need to achieve based on net energy is about 3,000 kilocal. We don't formulate lactation diet at 3,000 kilocal of net energy. And the lysine, you need a diet at one. 0.8 and 0 0.78%. Huge difference. In terms of cost, with today soybean meal price that we have in Canada, it's $40 to $60 per ton of cost difference for that lactation diet. So big, big difference. But my question, is this too low or is this too high? You know, we need to find where we need to fit on those requirements of the sow. Some data that we have from our research farm at High Life, we have a research farm of 1,200 sow where we have the gestile feed system, and we did many trials in lactation on lysine requirement and things like that. And we took a summary of our different trial and look at the intake of lysine on a daily basis and look at the next liter size performance. And you can see kind of a threshold when you hit that 56, 60 gram of lysine intake per day, you're pretty much set in terms of the next liter size. If you are below that 56, based on our database, you seem to lose about a pigs on average on the next liter size. And you can see it's pretty uh, a flat bar here, a flat bar here, although there's some variation. And that will mean a diet between 0.7 and 0.9% lysine versus 0.9 to 1.1%. We did the same thing with wean weight, you know, the wean weight of the letter during that lactation. And you do see the same break around that 51 to 56 gram of lysine intake per day, where you seem to optimize the weaning weight of the pigs. Below that, you seem to have a tendency for reducing weaning weight. Again, it's our data set with the sow that we have in the research farm, but there's a lot of sow in that data set, so I think they are really pretty strong data. Again, it may change depending on other factors in the farm, but that's just a point to show you that 50 to 56 gram of lysine intake per day for next liter size and weaning weight seems to be, in our case, where we want to be around. Then the second challenge in lactation is variation. Okay? How do you manage the variation in terms of intake and litter weight gain? I told you that the litter weight gain was a big driver of requirement of lysine. You can see based on the database that we have in our research farm, we have around 2.9 kg per day of litter growth for the whole litter, and we have a CV of about 21%. I just put a normal distribution curve, which is not reality, but just to show the example, 20-21% variation. In terms of intake, if you have a 6.5 kg intake in lactation, our data show that we have about 18% variation in intake. So huge variation at the end of the day. So when you take intake plus later weight gain variation, you have a widespread of data that you have to manage when you look at feeding sow in lactation. So how do we manage that? So either we feed a very high lysine diet or a high lysine diet to make sure you cover the needs of all the sow that you feed in lactation, or you try to tailor the needs of every sow by using precision feeding or blend feeding, however you call it. But you need still to know how much energy and lysine you need to, for every sow based on their intake and later growth. So here's some data that we have from the NRA model that was shared to me by uh, Letizia from the CDPQ you know, about can we achieve those requirements of the sow. I talked earlier about energy. This is a simulation using a 13 megajoule per kg of metabolism energy lactation diet and looking, can we fill the requirement of the cell based on the NRA model? And you can see that you never almost going to meet the requirement of the cell. This is by parity. The black dotted line is the average of the herd, so let's look at that line. You start around 50, 60% of the requirement that you're able to meet with that type of energy level, and then you reach about 85, 90%. Okay, so you're always short of energy. The intake will drive a lot that proportion of sow that are with, with, with energy, energy restriction or not. But this is the average of the herd. And if you look at the gilt, you are much lower than the older sow because they eat less and they, have, they are still a growing animal as well. So you can see that the first week, you know, about 45 to 70% of the time, you are lower on energy, okay, versus what you need exactly. Same thing for lysine. The lysine is a bit the other thing, the other, the other side of it. You have a lactation diet at 1% lysine, and based on the other model, 
Look at how many times every cell are overfed. The need of lysine, you know, on a daily basis, it's more around eight, you know, grams, okay, instead of that 10 grams that we have with a single lactation diet. For sure, at the start, you are short, but at the end, you overfeed those cells most of the time. So when we have one diet, we cut here, and we overfeed over there. So how can we manage that better? And is there an impact on performance by doing that? Phosphorus is about the same thing as lysine, even more pronounced. You have about 75% of the time that you overfeed the cell if you feed a diet at 0.45, that's just about phosphorus. If you look at what it's done in Europe, the level of digestible phosphorus in diet are, are much lower than what we do in North America. Okay, so they may be more around 0 0.30, 0 0.37, 0 0.35, 0 0.37. So the time they overfeed the cell, it's much, le much less in Europe. So like I said, we did a lot of work in lactation. One of the trials we did after the first two, three trials we did, we used the NRA model and we tried to do what we call precision feeding. So we did two different diets, a low lysine diet, a high lysine diet that we blend, you know, on a daily basis or every two or two, three days to try to meet the cell requirement based on their past intake and based on the growth curve of those pigs in lactation. And then we had a single diet, a 1% lysine diet, where we mix 45% of this one and 55% of this one to have a single diet fed all the way through, okay? Good number of sow, 480 sow on the trial, you know, and we use the gestalt feeder that we have to do the blend feeding in the research barn. So look at the performance. Again, good number of sow, no difference on number of wean, little weight, no difference, although it was a bit higher on the standard diet, the one person lies in diet. Uh, the weight gain of the litter was 0.1 kg more. It was not highly significant, but the p-value was around 0.2. 0.9.10, so we call that a trend. Feed intake was about the same, a bit numerically higher on that one, mostly because we fed a lower protein diet, so that can drive a bit the intake a bit better. The weight loss, that's where we saw a difference. On the precision feeding program, we had higher weight loss. It was a significant value. And if you look at the lysine intake on that trial, 65 versus 50 gram. And remember the graph I've shown you, that 50 gram was kind of the threshold for us, not we don't want to be lower than that to try to optimize performance. In that trial with the in-run model, we're on 50 grams of intake per day versus 65 with the one-person diet all the way through based on the intake of the cell. If you look at the nice part about it, nitrogen and phosphorus excretion were reduced by 28 and 42%, which makes sense because you feed less protein, less excretion. So in terms of environmental impact, big advantage. And if you look at the lysine, of the diet, you know, the 1%, this one will have been a 0.76% digestible lysine diet with that feed intake to meet that 50 gram. Again, the feed intake, you have to account for wastage. If there's a lot of wastage, you have to take that into account in your calculation. But if I use the net intake that we have with the, the feed system, there may be a bit of wastage. We need a diet at 0.76. So what are the opportunities for sound lactation? Again, the economics are very important to be a decision and to make a decision to install those systems. Performance benefit, we haven't seen a lot of performance benefits because we feed enough lysine into our cell. And in terms of energy, as I said, it's really hard to meet the energy requirement of the cell. But feed cost saving, yes, there should be a big one, depending where you start from. If you feed a 1.1, 1.2% lysine diet, and you can do precision feeding and having a 0.85, 0.9% diet on average, there could be some big saving. Just an example, if you formulate for 65 grams of intake per day versus 55, a 10 gram difference. In today's market, it's $30, $35 per ton or $12 per cell per year based on 275 kg of lactation diet per year per cell, okay? So $12 per cell per year to drop by 10 grams your lysine intake per day without affecting performance. You have to be sure on that end as well. And for sure, the environmental footprint, much better if you overfeed and you downgrade your lysine, phosphorus to the requirement of the sow to be closer to the requirement without affecting performance, you're going to reduce excretion. So how can we justify the investment in those feeder in a sow farm? Labor, I'll come back to that at the end. The labor is a big issue in our industry, so how can we address that with those uh, automated systems? But one point that we talk about or we think about when we built new farm in Quebec or even when we retrofit a farming room and we need more space, can we get rid of the front alley in front of the sow? Okay, by putting no alley in front of the sow, you're going to save some square foot. But if you do that, you need a feed system 
to be automated. You cannot go in the crate and adjust the drop, uh, feed by hand, or things like that. You need a system that is adjusted by himself to avoid you know, the labor uh, option to adjust the feed level. So let's talk about Noel in front of the sow. The square feet saving that I estimated is about seven and a half square feet per farming crate. At $50 of building cost, it's $275 per crate that you save. Doesn't pay for the whole system, but pay for part of it or good part of it. On top of that, you can save on feed line, water line, electricity, because you have less line, because the crate are face-to-face -face or in front of the wall. So that could be other saving as well. But you need a crate with a swing gate, because you need to enter the sow and move back the sow to exit the, the farming crate. But most of the barn that we have today are built like that anyway. And I know people that have done 2,000, 2,500 sow unit with no oil in front of the sow, and it seems to work well. Okay? So that's something to take into account. I was in the U.S. last week visiting a farm and talking about that, and the guy said, no way, I'm never going to do that. So there's a different school of thought on that, but that's a way to justify the investment into a blend feeding system, smart feeding system, and saving a bit of money on square foot. So some example of picture, you know, a face-to-face -face sow in farming, uh, either to the wall or face-to-face. -face. So again, it's feasible. We have farms that do it, and it seems to work well. Moving to gestation, same thing as lactation. One single diet all the way through. Uh, I know David talked about different diet and gestation, but today the reality with the system that we have, it's not always possible or feasible. Doesn't mean that in new barn construction, you, mean, you have to think about that still. Same thing, formulate on amino acid, gram of lysine per day. The only thing that is different from lactation, the sow in gestation eat a fixed amount of feed based on body condition, but there's no variation in feed intake. So you, it's easier to assess the requirement and build a diet because the sow are fed a fixed amount of feed throughout gestation, depending on their body condition, okay? We still need to account for parity. A young sow versus an older sow have different needs. A, a, a P1 animal in first gestation is still a growing animal, so the lean deposition is still there, so you have to account for that when you build your gestation program. What is the main objective in gestation is to control the weight gain. You have a sow, wean, bred, different body condition, and you want to bring that sow to an ideal body condition at farrowing. So it's all about controlling the weight gain and the body condition of the sow when she's going to farrow 15, 16 weeks after. So the feed quantity will vary mostly the first five to six weeks. David talked about that, increasing the feed intake, you know, the first five, six weeks based on body condition. After that, in late gestation, same thing. We have a different school of thought about how much feed we need to give to those sows. We call that bump feeding. We did some trial on that, and it seemed the response versus genotype is different. When you have a fat genotype, the need for that extra feed may be more versus a lean genotype, and that's what we found in some of the research we did with different genotype in our research barn. Uh, again, sow lysine requirement is low in early gestation. I'll show you that. Higher in mid, and what about late gestation? How much you need to give more? Energy is one thing, but amino acid, it's important to care about that. And today, with a diet at 0.55% digestible lysine, we are overfeeding the sow mostly in early gestation, okay? Uh, the need of the sow in early gestation is about 0.35 and 0.5, 0.4% uh, digestible lysine. So this is a typical gestation feed program, very schematic curve, you know, the thin sow, you feed them a bit more the first five, six weeks. The sow that are in good body condition, plain level of feed, the fat sow, plain level of feed, and then the question about bump feeding. So just something very general, uh, the way we do feeding sow in gestation those days. Talk about amino acid requirement. I went back to some old data that I did in a presentation 10 years ago about the requirement of the sow early versus late gestation. And you can see on lysine, there's about a 1.3 to 2.2% times increment of lysine requirement. Okay, there's variation. And again, if I look at the NRA model and other model, you're going to see that same variation in terms of increase in lysine requirement. So it's not all determined really good yet, but we know we need, they seem to need more lysine at the end of gestation. So this is some data that I took from some study that have been done by the INRA, you know, uh, looking at a single diet in gestation or a single diet with phosphorus level or lysine level and looking at the requirement of the sow throughout gestation. And you can see that with the single diet, we overfeed those sow almost always in gestation. If you look at phosphorus, it's about the same. The scale is look big, but it's not that big. It's about 0.2, 0.3% phosphorus. And here about 0.2, 
no, 0.1 or 0.15% uh, digestible lysine, okay? So we often see, in our case, diet that are even higher than that in gestation. So you can imagine that early gestation, we overfeed those cells, and same thing for phosphorus. So some data from the same study that they did, they use a controlled diet at 0.47% digestible lysine. They use a high and low lysine diet that they blend. You can see that they blend 95% of the low and only 5.5% of the high to have an average of 0.39. And in terms of performance, there was no big difference, but look at the lysine intake, nitrogen excretion, phosphorus excretion, feeding cost, 3%, $12 per cell per year. So when I look at the lactation diet, the 10 grams, about $12 per cell per year. Gestation to feed 0.39 versus 0.47, it's about $12 per cell per year in that study. But remember that in North America, we often have diet at 0.55% digestible lysine or 0.54. Same study that show uh, the overfeeding of the sow based on one single diet versus precision feeding. You can see the dark blue and the light blue. It's when the sow are fed in excess of 20% a zero to more than 20% of lysine excess, you can see that most of the time they are overfed. If you do precision feeding, you cut that time of overfeeding the sow, and the P1, it's even, it's even more. We did some research, by, we haven't done research at Highlight, but there's some research that has been done with the CDPQ uh, on that type of uh, precision feeding and lactation. Uh, the first trial that was done two, three years ago, if I recall well, uh, it was a 600 cell unit with multiple parity. And what we found in that study, there was a tendency for increasing liveability of the pigs on gilt. So the first litter of the gills, 3.1% lower pre-weaning and higher birth weight. And in that study, we were able to reduce feed costs by about 9 to $10 per cell. But it's going back two, three years ago with feed costs that were lower than what we have today. So that $12 that I was talking to you about, seems to be the number that we have today. The problem is that we look at the carryover effect of those better performance on the P1 or the gilt, and we didn't have enough P1 on the next cycle because we have some culling, and so the size of the barn was 600 cell with only 20% of the gilt, so not enough animal to have the carryover effect. So as you know, some of you may will visit Thursday morning the research barn of the city PQ. It's one of the nicest research barn that I've seen, you know, in terms of feeding equipment. It's a 650 sow uh, about an hour from here uh, that can do blending of four different elements, four different feed in gestation and lactation. Uh, so what we did with that barn, because it was a startup, we used that first, the fill of 600 gilt all at once to do that trial that we did to repeat that trial with no more gilt. So we had four batch of 120 gilt as the barn startup, and we did three treatment, a single diet, single diet with a bump feeding, just the concept of bump feeding, and the whole precision feeding from breeding to the end, okay? Uh, that trial will also follow the progeny performance, so some of the pigs from those different treatments will be following nursery finisher to see if there's an impact on performance carryover from the, the litter fed the different diet. Uh, the cell portion data is completed. I think Letizia is in the room today. I know we had an early presentation of the data. It's not fully available yet, so I won't talk about it, it's not my data. I'll let CDPQ to present that uh, to you uh, one day. But very interesting trial. Will it support the use of precision feeding, the saving that we talk about, the environmental uh, impact? Uh, very nice trial that has been done that we'll have some data pretty soon on that. So one thing that we have today, and we've talked about that with group housing, we can apply precision feeding. In crate, it's pretty hard to have a blend feeding system for every sow with a feed unit on top of every crate, very costly. So today with the group housing that we are moving towards, you know, in Canada, uh, again, I guess in the US as well, we have opportunity to implement those systems because we're gonna feed more sow per unit, you know, 15 to 50 to 60 if you have a full ESF system. So the investment on a sow basis is much less, okay? And with those systems, you can feed better sow. We talk about weight gain control. How many times you went to a feed barn a gestation barn with feed drops that are all over the board. The sow may receive five pounds, the next one six and a half, the other one four and a half because it's not well adjusted. At least with those feed systems, you can set up feed curve. And if you could have the weight of the sow, I know David talked about that, I think a weight of the animal would be the extra mile, you know, to be able to apply those systems. But at least you can feed uh, the sow with the proper amount of feed based on the feed system. 
Preferral, uh, there was a talk about that this morning, and that's a, an area of interest for myself that we, I think we should spend more time to think about that. It's a short period, you know, the last four, five, six days before farrowing, however you call it. In dairy cow, it's a big concept. They talk about 21-day transition in dairy cow. In pigs, a sow should be the same as a dairy cow in my mind in those type of concept, but we have different system that we have to deal with in terms of application. So, uh, David talked about that this morning, about energy supply. I'm going to come back on that. DCAB, the dietary catch and anion balance, you know, to improve calcium mobilization for the sow when she farrow. That's also a concept used in dairy that we can apply in sow. And can we, help, can we have precision feeding to help around that period? So the challenge we have is that we have gestation, lactation, and then we have gestation to lactation, and then we can do an in-between. We can either start the sow on lactation before they farrow. You can keep them on gestation until they farrow. But what about having a different diet or a mix of those two diets during that four or five days before the sow farrow? <clears throat> so data on constipation. Uh, we talk about fiber, the importance of fiber to gut health and well behavior of the sow, good behavior of the sow, well-being of the sow, we'll say. You can see that if you have a lower constipation score, more soft feces, your duration of farrowing will go down. The R square is not really high, but the concept of having no constipation around farrowing makes sense, okay? So it's really important. The energy status of the sow, we've talked about that this morning a bit. A sow that will have her last meal less than three hours before she farrow will have less uh, assistance at farrowing and lower stillborn. So all the concept of feeding the sow with different energy source and closer to the time she farrow makes sense. And can we use precision feeding or smart feeder to be able to apply that, okay? So just a summary of the pre-farrow opportunity. Again, I don't know of anybody applying that today, but that's something to think about down the road. Nursery, I don't have a lot to say about nursery. I just put that point there. Uh, we know the lysine requirement of the pigs in nursery. You know, we feed our pigs with three, four, five different phases during nursery. Uh, there, I don't think there's a lot of data on individual requirement of the pigs based on variation in weight and things like that. Uh, I think we need to do some work on that. Is there any interest? Uh, the only thing I could think about sometimes is the transition from one phase to the other one, especially the early phase that are much different. Can we do blending of those diets to improve the transition and reduce the, the lag sometime when we switch from one diet to the other one? Uh, I haven't tried that, but just something to think about. Finisher, that's the biggest part in terms of saving. Uh, I think it's been the biggest part of uh, interest for precision feeding. The current practice is to feed three to six diet from 25 to market. Okay, that's probably, some people still do two, but in large commercial system, it's three to six. Uh, the requirements are key. Uh, Count Zdo Pomar is in the room, he's one of the leaders in precision feeding, understanding the requirement of the sow and building system to apply this precision feeding on grow finished pigs. There's a significant potential on feed cost saving, that's pretty clear. Uh, again, it's based on blend feeding, two extreme diet that you blend based on requirement of the pigs as they go through the finisher stage. You can feed pigs one by one on a daily basis, okay, which require more measurement of the weight variation because that's another things that you have to consider in feeding those pigs, or you can do group feeding, which is a bit more easier when you change diet on a weekly basis or daily basis for a group of pigs based on their growth curve. So again, a graph that I borrowed to some publication from Kansas you look at the different requirement of the pigs, and if you have a three-phase feeding system program, you're gonna underfeed here, overfeed, overfeed, so you try to be as close as that curve, but look at the variation with that curve. It's pretty hard to do that with a single five, six feet feed program. As, if you add more feed, you're going to be closer, but it's still a, a challenge to manage those, those feed programs at the farm level after. So different level of application. Again, same concept, high low lysine diet, high fast, low fast diet that you blend. Like I said, group feeding will be based on average of the group, the weight, and you change the mix daily. Is there value to do that without having the weight and the variation of the pigs within the same pen? Uh, but at least it's more applicable. If you go to what I call the ultimate precision feeding, you need either the weight of the pigs and manage daily feeding for every pig based on their weight and intake as well. Okay? But you need equipment that are able to make that happen. So again, in finisher, big feed cost saving. 10% on a finisher pigs is a lot of money today. 10% five years ago was still a lot of money, but today it's even more. You know? So the feed cost saving is huge. You know, if you 
depending where you start from. If you overfeed a lot and you tailor the requirement of the pigs, you're going to save more, depending on your feed program. So that could be variable case by case. Again, nitrogen, phosphorus excretion up by 30% reduction, and greenhouse gas emission by 10%. So all things that we need to think about to be a sustainable industry, those things will come to be a big player in the growth of our industry or to the, the keep moving with our industry. The challenge, you need equipment, okay, that are cost effective. That's a bit of a challenge to build up equipment with the scale, the RFID tag, the reading, all those things, and a finisher pen. Group pulsing will encourage that versus single pen where you have less pigs per pen. Uh, you need to manage variability, like I said. The weight at entry and finisher, the CV is about 18% based on our data. Uh, the scale are expensive and more maintenance in the barn, so you have to think about that. Does visual imagery technology will be the next thing that we'll have to use? I was at a, a symposium last week in the US, and they seem to work towards that, being able to identify a pig's weight, even read the tag of a pig's with a camera in a pen, which is pretty neat. Uh, and just think about the, the tag cost, you know, there's a cost, and when you send those pigs to slaughter, I don't know about in the US, but in Canada, they have to be removed. Eh? You cannot send a pig to the packing plant with an RFID tag. So imagine shipping 2,000 pigs and the guy has to cut the tag or do it at the plant. It's a bit of a challenge. Keep that in mind. So we need something that read a tattoo or something that is not, you know, a piece of equipment you put on the hair of the pigs, but maybe it's going to come one day. So the other thing that I, very important, if you think about large production system, talk about five-phase diet versus two-phase. Less bin on the farm and less chance to get wrong feed for the wrong group of pigs. How many times you empty a batch of finisher pigs and you have the stage five diet left in the bin because the guy delivered stage five, the pigs were shipped the next day because the schedule of shipping changed and you start those pigs at 20, 25 kg with a late finisher diet. It happened in nursery, it happened in finisher more than we think. What about the meal? The guys at the mill will like me a lot if I say it's only two diet and you ship those two diet to the farm and you don't have to manage my five diet program and things like that, much easier, okay? Uh, the accessibility on the public standpoint, when you talk about environmental outpack, it's really important to think about that. It's gonna come one day that we can reduce our output by doing those type of things, so we have to think about that. And like I said, the cost saving and uh, environmental impact is huge. We did a small trial on blend feeding. We haven't done too much work in Finisher. We did one trial where we have a blend feeding system in one of our research barn, where we took a five-phase program, which what we think is 100% of the requirement of the pigs. We may overfeed, but let's call it 100% of the requirement of the pigs. We did the blend feeding, so same type, 100%, but we change the feed every five, seven days. You know, I change my proportion of the two diet every five, seven days to be closer to that curve. And I did that with 90% of the requirement. I just dropped by 5%. I wanted it to be safe. And at the end of the day, my 5% drop in requirement on the blend feeding, everybody had the same performance. And I was saving five to $7 per ton just by cutting by 5%, by having a better feeding all the way through on a weekly basis, okay? It's, it's the first trial we did. We want to do more work on that, but that's something that we have to keep in mind that we may overfeed our pigs and finisher, and the cost saving of having a precision feeding program may be pretty interesting. Last one on the, on the uh, area of production, guild development. Uh, we are often limited by the number of diets we feed to our guilds, and we often do a poor job raising those guilds, okay? Unless they are in a specific GDU barn, even that sometimes it's a bit of a challenge. And we need to think that those are the foundation of our herd. We need to treat them the right way. So can we use smart feeder to control guild grow rate? We know the heavy guild is a problem. Too big of a guild when they get bred, when they farrow, the lameness, locomotion problem, calling. It's a challenge, okay? I'm not saying by controlling the grow, you'll solve all those problems, but is there a time during the growth period of the guilt where you can limit the intake of the animal and full feed that animal when it's time to do it at the end of their growing period before breeding, okay? So the smart feeder or control feeder can help you to do that. Uh, an example of application is in a barn where you have only one diet that you can feed to those guilt. You can have a guild developer diet from 25 to 80. You can have a gestation diet that you may have already on the salt farm. You can use a blend feeding and adapt the feeding of those animals based on those two diets. Okay? So something to think about on GDU development. I don't have a lot of experience with that. I know Ayat has some experience in the U.S. with some system. Uh, so I don't have a lot of experience, but I think there's application down the road uh, for those guilds. So what can hold us back not doing it? Okay? The scare of technology for people. Uh, I mean that 
age range where technology for me is not always easy. You know, I'm 50, and it's uh, the adaptation to new technology. I still like to, to print my stuff. You know, I have my office bef beside Jean Philippe, and I have full of binder. He has nothing in his office. Okay, everything is on the whatever in his computer, whatever. I print a lot of stuff, so I'm not very good for the environment. Don't tell that to anybody. So it's it's a matter of age, eh? matter of uh, technology. It's a matter of generation. Uh, what about technology in the farm? Durability. Will those systems last? A lot of question at first, 15, 20 years ago, you put that in a system and it, where there's dust, humidity, uh, the maintenance is not easy always for, for those initial systems. But today, I think the system that we have, either the Gestalt system or the company system, have proved that they can last in the barn because they are much better uh, done than 15, 20 years ago. How to calculate the ROI, it's always a challenge. If you don't have performance benefit, it's tough, you know, to, to tell the producer or system, buy it if you don't show ROI, but there's other stuff that you need to think about. Uh, and how can we assess the environmental impact? I think that's something we cannot put big dollar value always on that, but it's going to come to be an important point as we move uh, towards uh, our business growth in the future. Are our pigs fed the way they should be on a daily basis? Think about lactation. I'm seeing farms sometime on a Friday afternoon at Lunchtime, it's over. Nobody in the farm. And weekend, we know what, what is weekend. Half staff or one third of the staff. And if you feed by hand, even with a head lip system, you need to fill the feeder, you need to adjust the, 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 the feed drop. So there's about 35% of the time in lactation where the sow may not be as fed the way it should be. I'm not saying it's always the case, but there's a risk there. Uh, no access to the farm. You have flooding, you have a winter storm. Nobody can go at the farm, can feed the sow. But if you have a nominated feeding system with Feed in the bin. If there's no feed in the bin, nothing will happen. But still, something to think about. Although it's not a justification to buy the system, it's a, it's a security at the end of the day. In nursery, I was talking about blend feeding, but can you use those systems to stimulate the pigs by dropping feed, having a, something that happened when you move the pigs from the farrowing to the weaning that stimulate the pigs to go eat, you know? Uh, smaller amount, stimulation mode, things that you can probably do with those type of systems. Last point I want to talk about, labor. It's uh, something that was shared by me, by Stéphane Clement, which is in the room over there, about thinking about labor and how we want to hire people in the next 15, 20 years in our pig barn. What the new generation are doing, you know, they play with computer, smartphone, technology. Okay, again, my generation, not as much, but the younger generation, that's what they do. Okay, what our labor will look like in 10 years from now. There was a code that was shared again by Stefan from Gordon Sprunk at the Alleman in 2019 in China. You see, before looking at artificial intelligence, we're looking at better training of our people and find solutions to automatize the important tasks our staff do not like to execute, like washing and feeding. Feed, hard work, labor, handwork, is tough to get people to do that today. You know, they are used to the computer, to the smartphone. So just think about that when you think about automated feeding system. The new generation, they like technology. I talk about that. Even people that cannot read our language or talk our language will be able to go on the phone and play with a app. And if you look at the gestal system or the system, they are made to be a bit newfie proof. You know, you're able to go and look at some diagram and some colors, so you don't have to read, you don't have to understand the language, but you can work with those systems. What people want to do, they want to analyze data. They want to work with machine learning specialists. They want to be big data specialists, you know. What people don't like to do, you know, data entry on paper, you know, clerk, things like that. Construction, uh, assembly, factory workers, it's tough to find people to work with their hand today. So that's the new generation, and we have to think about that when we develop our production system. So in conclusion, we still have work to do. We still have to learn about how to utilize precision feeding or the technology that we have today. Uh, we need to determine the requirement of the pigs. I think people have done a great job, but there's going to be a lot of work in that area. And the reason why is that now we have the tool to apply. If you go back 30 years ago, doing research on precision feeding with end feeding, counts do what we all have done. You know, you, you can ask people to blend by hand. You know? So today with the system that we have, we are able at least to make those things happen. We still need to work on good equipment. I think we have that. Cost effective, I think everybody is going down that path to be more cost effective in terms of building and equipment that is workable, will work well, but with less cost for the producer. There's been a huge progress, past and future. You need to make our industry more attractive for new generation. I think by having systems that are 
easier to work with or more fun to work with. I think I'm not saying that the, the barn will be full tomorrow morning of people wanted to work in a pig barn because they get all excited about the gestalt feed system. But I think it could help at least instead of saying the guys you can add the feed by hand or adjust the feeder. Then you have a system that you can play with and have more data to extract from. So the feed cost saving, I think I just do a summary of what gestation, lactation, finisher pigs. You know, we can talk about $10 in finisher pigs, $24 in sow, so let's say call it a buck a pig. You know, if you put that back on the 24, 25 pigs weaned per sow per year. So there's some feed cost saving to justify all the investment in equipment. Not always maybe, but at least you get some money to grab from. Environmental impact, it's a no-brainer. We can have some saving on that and that that's going to be important. And they can do other stuff. They can control water, temperature. So when you have a system that is smart and you can integrate other stuff to it, not just feeding, then you can duplicate the benefit of that system. Okay? And they can help for data collection and also decision process. How many times we go to a barn, it's too late. Can we use those systems to make better decisions and prevent instead of reacting to problems in the farm? I'm all done. Thanks a lot. <laughs>